those of you who are at the, uh, the chow line uh, can stock up and head for your seats. We generally try to have uh, enough food here to make it through till uh, lunch. Keep you alive for a short period of time here. This looks like a voracious crowd. Actually. Yes. <laughs> So good morning and uh, on behalf of our CEO and President, Dr. John Hammer, I want to welcome you all to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I also want to welcome our viewers on the web. I don't know if my mic is loud enough. Are you guys picking me up okay? All right. Um, I've got a couple of administrative details and then want to kind of outline what we're here for and are, are doing today. We have a really wonderful, terrific, timely uh, report and, and topic to discuss this morning. Uh, administratively, uh, we're going to be here for about 90 minutes. Uh, if you're viewing on the web, you should be able to download a copy of the report and, uh, and, and follow along at home. We probably won't refer you to page numbers as we go, so you, you'll have to do a little uh, work on your own. I'm not sure, but you also may be able to download the, uh, the view graphs, so those in the room will see them. Uh, you'll be able to see them at, uh, from the web as well. Uh, this is on the record. We are recording this. There will be an archive of both the video and the audio that will be posted at CSIS afterwards. So if, if uh, at the end of this you look at it and you say, what the heck did Frank Hoffman actually say? You can go back and, uh, and, and pick up on that okay, uh, afterwards. Always a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's what a time we're in. Right? We, we have, we're in the middle of, as all of you know, our fourth downturn in the last uh, uh, 65, 70 years, and, uh, uh, and we have no idea how low it's going to go, how far it's going to go, et cetera. You've got some very important questions about what do we need this military for, and how do we size and shape it properly? How do we align strategy and programs and policy and resources going forward? You had in the past week some very lively exchanges. I would urge you to watch the videos if you haven't uh, between the Chief of Staff of the Army and members of the various Armed Services Committees. Uh, it's a, quite a robust uh, uh, example of the difference between Article I of the Constitution and Article II. Um, you can look those up on your own time. <laughs> the, uh, we're really wrestling with uh, questions like, you know, do you are we looking for the force we can afford, or are we trying to figure out the force we can, that we need here? And are we preparing for a world that we're trying to make it come out a certain way, or are we preparing for a world that is what it is, and we're going to have to deal with it? And of course, it's, it's a complex set of questions. I'm making it look like binary issues, but they're not very binary issues at all. Yeah. Traditionally, the military has assessed the adequacy of its force structure, including readiness and training and equipping and so on, against a set of threats and, and the war plans that are designed to meet those threats. But that's probably not the approach that we're going to need in the future. Or rather, it's that and a lot more. Because we have a complex set of future scenarios. And we call them in this report vignettes, because we're not quite ready to distinguish them with the acronym or the or the name scenario, because that implies then that you've got to build a plan to, uh, to deal with it. But from a vignette's point of view, it allows you to scope against a huge uh, set of issues, if you will. And we haven't assessed in this report the budgetary and resource requirements to deal with these vignettes, if you will. That's work that still has to be done. Um, and this report is focused not on the whole world, but on the parts that are have primacy in the defense uh, strategic guidance that uh, was issued January a year ago. So a very strong CENTCOM focus, Middle East and counterterrorism, a very strong PACOM focus, rebalancing to Asia and counterterrorism, et cetera. And of course, the theaters don't mirror one another the way they did when I was growing up in this system, where it was pretty fungible to have forces that were relevant for one set of plans in one theater be relevant to another. So all of that adds to the complexity. And then, of course, from yesterday's wire services comes word that, uh, in fact, that one headline said, Army seeks to complement air-sea battle. You know, Secretary McHugh said the Army's moving forward, and we've heard this word. In fact, I think General Odierno talked about this Office of Strategic Land Policy when he was here in this very room November last year. 
um, you know, to deal with ideas about forcible entry and power projection and, and the involvement of ground forces in anti-access and aerial denial uh, operations. So to cover all of that, we've got both a nice thick document and a very robust conversation here this morning. Uh, leading this is, is our senior fellow, Nate Fryer. Uh, Nate Fryer had a, was a career Army officer, um, spent time at the Army War College, spent time in OSD, spent a lot of time in, in theaters of operations, especially Iraq, and has been a senior fellow here at CSIS now for about uh, six or seven years. Um, and he's joined by a marvelous panel. He'll introduce the panel. So I want to ask you all to uh, please join me in welcoming Nate Fryer, CSIS. Thank you. Sam, you can, uh, we can move out here to the, the podium. Well, thank you very much, David. That's a very kind introduction to what has been a very, uh, what I think has been an exceptionally challenging report uh, study in a time of great change inside the Department of Defense. Um, before I begin talking about the substance of the report, let me first uh, take an opportunity for some thank yous and then also introduce my panelists um, before proceeding. First, I think this report would not have been possible without the support of the Army G8, and in particular, uh, the Army Quadrennial Defense Review Office inside G8, under the leadership of Major General John Rossi, um, with the able assistance of Tim Muchmore and Jim Boatner in particular, with respect to this report. Their assistance has been invaluable. We also received a great deal of support from uh, U.S. Pacific Command, U.S. Central Command, the uh, service component commands underneath them, the Joint Staff, OSD, et cetera, in the process of this. And their contributions uh, to the substance of this report have been um, both invaluable and at many times uh, groundbreaking in, in the ideas we arrived at uh, through their assistance. We had a great working group and a great senior review group who spent time with us going over our ideas, fleshing things out, and testing, testing things. They, too, deserve some credit. You can see who was involved in that when you, pay, when you leaf through the report. Um, we're indebted to some, several CSIS senior scholars um, who also helped us a great deal in sort of guiding the report and arriving at some of, in particular, our regional insights that we came to. Finally, let me just uh, and actually publicly mention the research team uh, who worked very hard at getting a report, I think, that will be very influential, will be influential going forward um, in the defense review season. Stephanie Sanek, Senior Fellow and direct, Deputy Director of the International Security Program, Jacqueline Guy, Curtis Buzzard, Errol Lauman, Steve Nicolucci, J.P. Pellegrino, uh, our military fellows, Sam Eaton and Megan Loney, also um, interns with the program. They've been uh, absolutely great teammates in this process, and I wanted to thank them publicly. Um, as for the panel, um, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes talking about the 10 or 15 minutes talking about the report itself. But I'm joined on stage here with a, by this panel that I think will bring a great deal of insight and experience to the discussion. Um, on my far right is uh, Mr. Barry Pavel. He's director of the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security at the Atlantic Council. Spent 18 years inside the Department of Defense in various positions in the Senior Executive Service, and also was a Special Assistant to the President and a Senior Director for plan, uh, Defense Policy and Strategy in the White House uh, from 08 to July of 10. To my right is Lieutenant General Retired James Dubik. He's a Senior Fellow at the Institute for the Study of War. He is a Career Infantry Officer, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry to hear oh, about that. I'm an yeah. artilleryman. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he spent 37 years uh, in the United States Army and commanded as a general officer the 25th Infantry Division, 1st Corps at Fort Lewis, and uh, the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq. Then on my left, an old friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Frank Hoffman. He's a senior research fellow at National Defense University's uh, Institute for National Strategic Studies. He's a former Marine officer. I'm sorry about that as well. Also, also an infantryman who's walked and carried a packet uh, rifle. Uh, I've ridden everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> He's recently left the Department of the Navy as Senior Director for Naval Capabilities and Readiness. He's widely publicized and a prolific commentator on the future of conflict and on hybrid warfare in particular. Frank and I have been uh, 
jousting mates many times and co-conspirators many times on a lot of ideas. Before I begin, I just want to remind everybody as well to turn all cell phones, pagers, blackberries, etc., off so we don't get interrupted in the process. All the panelists will make some kind of a presentation and then after the presentation we'll have time for questions so just let us run through our run through our discussion and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. There will be microphones present throughout. Just raise your hand and I'll moderate the, the Q&A and make sure that you're called on in an orderly fashion. So the intent of today is to talk about a report again that was chartered by Army G8 on uh, the, f the potential, the future potential for the large-scale employment of U.S. ground forces, that being uh, U.S. Army, Marine, and Special Operations Forces, and the U.S. CENTCOM and PACOM AORs. And alongside that sort of view of the prospective employment of those forces, we were sort of chartered to evaluate what the Department of Defense calls future challenges risk associated with uh, the employment of those forces. And with that, we started the process in October of, uh, really the f right around the beginning of October of the previous year, of last year, going through this process. And what you see here today is really the culmination of that effort. So if I could, the next slide, please. Here's our study purpose. It's all in the past tense now, thankfully. Um, this is what we did. Uh, our charter really was to identify core interests in the two regions and identify ground relevant hazards in those regions that are most likely to threaten those interests over the next two decades. As I said, uh, in the, before we, we uh, developed a framework to assess future challenges risk and then assess that risk against a set of what became 20 regional vignettes that really grew out of our assessment of um, the trends and insights in the, in the two regions of concern to the report. Finally, we compared our risk assessment to the current direction of strategy and policy to arrive at certain judgments on general risk mitigation, policy level risk mitigation measures that the Department of Defense might take uh, going forward. Let me make a few uh, qualifications because I think they're important. Um, number one, large scale in, in the context of this report is not necessarily uh, what was considered large scale in the past or would have been interpreted as large scale. Our floor in this report is really uh, an Army division, the ground combat element of Marine Expeditionary Force, or some combination of Special Operations, Marine, and Army forces that equal up to that. That's the floor. The ceiling could obviously be much higher than that. So that, in, our, in, our, in the context of this report, is large scale. Our judgments are qualitative. They're not quantitative. Okay? So what we're, what we, we're chartered to look at is what the force might be asked to do, not specifically the extent to which the force might be asked to do it. That is really a follow-on. I think, to this effort. And then finally, we accounted for what we uh, labeled in a question that I've been very interested in for quite some time. We, we tried to account for what we call problems that emerge from disorder or the failure of competent authority to control resources, territory, dangerous resources, et cetera, um, as well as unfavorable order, which would be uh, really what it sounds like, a, a rising regional peer, uh, uh, another great power that rises up in, in a very traditional military fashion threatens U.S. interests in a way that uh, forces us to respond. Next slide, if I could, Sam. I'm going to cut right to the chase. We came to four key findings, basically. We came to a lot of findings. It's a very big report. Um, but really, there's four key, th I would call these themes, you know, finding themes that rolled out of our report. The first is that the U.S. does face uh, future contingencies where U.S. policymakers will want the option to consider the large-scale employment of ground forces. Um, in a lot of conversation, that may appear to be a mom and apple pie conclusion, frankly. Um, but, it, but, but our view was in the contemporary debate where this, you really do have this perfect storm of uh, resource challenges inside the Department of Defense and a long experience with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there, the, the, the trend in strategy and policy right now is to really discount a large number of potential contingency events in the future as, as not necessarily breaching uh, a threshold that would have us employ ground forces, but we think that the, the future is somewhat different than that. We envision an expansive role for Army, Marine, general purpose, and, and general purpose forces and special operations forces in both regions. And one of the things we found is that the more conflicts, the more conflicts and crises involve challenges between peoples, uh, 
uh, the likelier that ground forces provide a qualitative advantage in the US military response. Second, after looking at the vignettes that we developed, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, after looking at the vignettes, we found that ground, the, the large scale uh, ground force uh, responses in the future will really fall into what we think are five basic archetypes. Uh, humanitarian response, distributed security, enable and support actions, peace operations, or limited conventional campaigns. Um, I'll talk uh, much more about those uh, as I go forward, but we found it to be most plausible that over the next two decades, ground forces are more <coughs> likely to respond to foreign internal or cross-boundary disorder, natural catastrophe, or third-party conflict, or finally some kind of large-scale enabling effort than they are uh, to respond to overt cross-border aggression by an adversary of the United States. In this whole construct of the five, there are two really, uh, there are two war fighting, uh, real war fighting uh, focused missions, which are the distributed security and the limited conventional campaign um, archetypes. We found the distributed security to be the largest cluster of demands um, over the next 20 years and therefore uh, potentially identified, we identify it as the, the best or likeliest war fighting focus for the ground forces going forward. Perhaps the most controversial finding that we came to is that classic major combat operations or the extended to post-stabilization operations of the kind that we've experienced over the last 12 years are likely the lesser included case over the next two decades. And I'll talk more about that in the future. Regional shaping we found to be a dominant demand, peacetime demand for all the ground forces across the board going forward. Um, some would argue that it should be a force driver, but we certainly see it as a, we see it as a dominant mission going forward. Um, but important is we, f we found in, co in consultation with regional strategists that the most important shaping efforts are those that are uh, with partners that are most capable, that appear to be most capable and most willing to actually participate in future contingency operations with the United States going forward. That's number one. And second, they should focus on preventing the most dangerous outcomes and preparing to respond to the most disruptive outcomes in each one of the regions. Finally, we found that current defense uh, priorities and really service priorities may not really align well with what we see are the future demands for the ground forces. I'll get into that a little more in the future, uh, in, in, in a few moments, but, but suffice it to say that um, we have six basic risk categories. We found future challenges risk to be either increasing or static in all six of those categories. And we found strategy, strategy and policy really are too focused on the most evident traditional state-based challenges and not really focused enough on consequential disorder. Distributed security itself is, very, is really inconsistent with the cur current direction of policy. And we found this idea of enabling and support actions to, run, to be somewhat countercultural to service culture. Um, finally, I think one of the biggest contributors to this problem is the fact that the force itself has become conditioned to respond to one contingency uh, type in particular, which is counterinsurgency from sort of fixed, a fixed and very sophisticated support architecture, which we don't think necessarily will hold true in the future. Let me go to the next slide. Here's just a pictorial of the five archetypes because that's the first question we always get. Note that we have the large circle just talks about the fact that the Army in particular has a very large theater setting bill. Really, the Army provides the foundation for all major operations in the areas of uh, you know, communications, ISR, uh, logistics, um, et cetera, and that on top of that, all of these operations would occur. Um, you can also see by this that we've placed the distributed security vignette or this distributed security archetype in the center of this chart largely because it's the greatest reservoir for future capabilities. Its success draws on the capabilities necessary to conduct the other operations. Um, and therefore, we think it's kind of the centerpiece of future capability. Next slide, please. Really, what we wanted to depict in this chart is the way DOD assesses risk, they, they assess it in, in four major categories, institutional risk, force management risk, uh, operational risk, and future challenges risk. Um, and borrowing from my friend here, Frank Hoffman, we actually borrowed this idea from him. This is what we call the fulcrum chart. The bottom line is, is uh, Institutional and force management risk really provide the foundation upon which the other two um, can be assessed and, and rest. And in the, current, in, the, in the current 
sort of structure, the way DOD man or assesses risk going forward is operational risk being sort of over the next 24 months, can we perform our war plans? It is heavily favored and more formalized than is this view of future challenges risk. And what we've tried to do is actually take a crack at rewriting the balance of that chart a little bit and looking more holistically at future challenges risk. One thing that's important though that we see is really today's operational risk is tomorrow's future challenges risk. They really are a continuum. Uh, one assesses the ability of uh, the ability of the force to, to respond to problems it sees now. The other uh, sort of assesses the force, force's ability to problems that we see in the future. And so they really do have similar characteristics and therefore are joined somewhat. Next slide, please, Sam. As a context for our study, we identified five core interests. I'm not going to go in, into great detail on those core interests, but it was one of our charters in the study. We think that these five core interests uh, that we derived really from an assessment of 25 years of national security policy and sort of public pronouncements of interest on the part of US policymakers, we think that these provide a foundation and are, tra are really translatable across uh, combatant commands. And you can see that you can see their individual sort of implementation or manifestation in those combatant commands. So these five core interests actually provided a foundation upon which or through which we could look at uh, the challenges in the particular regions and arrive at conclusions on what the likeliest demands would be in those regions. Next chart, please. In the process also, as we came up with the interest, we also developed a set of insights. Uh, we have 10 basic insights um, that we worked off of. And these insights, like the interest, became a bit of a lens um, for us to look at the regions and determine what the nature of the challenge in those regions will be. And let me just go over these um, a little bit. These insights, by the way, sort of are both a combination of assumptions and preliminary um, conclusions as we went into the beginning of the study. And then, and they held his insights largely because they were confirmed in the course of the study. Um, we do think that the United States will maintain its military advantages, but those advantages will erode. And that's very consistent with, uh, will erode over time. And that's very consistent with uh, current policy and thought in this area. Um, however, having said that, in spite of the erosion, we do also think that given a commitment to deterrence, major, uh, major conventional traditional conflict between the United States and other great powers is largely preventable. However, an area where we have probably least capability of preventers is the area of spontaneous civil conflict inside states, especially states of uh, importance to the United States, as well as proxy resistance to the United States by another great power. We do think that the two AORs of concern to this report are particularly uh, troublesome with respect to the generation of consequential threats to core interests. And we also came to the conclusion, perhaps in spite of current directions and policy, that wars between, quote, nations and between peoples um, and the, the conflicts that they actually um, generate will be, uh, will continue to be important to US strategy and policy going forward and will be um, the subject of contingency planning for some time to come. Uh, we do think the threats, threats to access are real and that states and non-state actors will continue to generate threats to access and frankly, threats to our freedom of maneuver in specific operational areas and that that threat is becoming more prolific um, and the capabilities are actually migrating down and democratizing. CBRN will be a problem in the future. Uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons and their control, proliferation and development will be a problem for the United States and will be a primary concern in US strategy for the next two decades. One key finding I think that's very important is that this idea of whatever you want to call it, the information revolution, access to information, et cetera, this is almost having a viral effect on the ability of conflicts to sort of spread. Um, not only is it a challenge to, to, to uh, operational security, but it allows a greater, diverse, a greater, more diverse universe of actors to interact with one another. Um, organize at, at distance and at range and conduct some somewhat coordinated actions that complicate US uh, interests. A host of accelerants will be a problem going forward over the next two decades. They include challenge governance, catastrophe, climate change, envir environmental de degradation, and also the increased, uh, increased um, 
um, competition for strategic resources. We will, the United States will have, continue to have a number of strong bilateral, multi, multilateral partnerships going forward. But frankly, uh, in the same way American defense uh, resources are declining, the resources of many of our partners are declining as well, um, which will leave us uh, in a position where we will remain sort of the most capable and able to respond to many instances of common concern between our allies and us. And then finally, I would just like to say that we think strategic warning for the most traditional military challenges will remain stable and significant, whereas strategic warning for those instances that spring from some kind of disorder uh, will be much more uh, in question and in doubt and will actually sort of compress the decision-making space afforded to U.S. decision makers. Next slide, Sam, please, thanks. Very quickly, let me just talk about our, 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 the trends we identify in U.S. Uh, CENTCOM. You can see on the right-hand side of this chart, we talk about these trends in particular in the takeaways, but the trends themselves are most, um, most important to this report. The bottom line is, is we think there's three basic trends in CENTCOM that will be the focus of U.S. defense strategy and planning going forward for the next, uh, for the foreseeable future. First is a prolific challenge to the authority and stability of vulnerable regional governments. Uh, second is malign Iranian behavior and its impact on the stability of the region. And finally is the uncertain control of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear capabilities. Um, I can talk about any one of those in great detail. You can see sort of some of the reasoning behind our, uh, our thoughts in that regard on the right, but in the interest of time, I want to move on and talk about the next region, and then we'll, we'll punt to uh, Q&A for the detailed discussion. Next slide, please, PACOM. So PACOM has four or five basic trends from our perspective. The most uh, dominant is an increasing competition for regional primacy, territory resources, uh, and freedom of action within the region and into the region. There are some alternative China futures um, that we think are probably under-considered. You know, currently, when you look at PACOM, the, the most common thought is the dominant sort of rising China that stays on a linear path upward. Um, we also think that there's, you know, there is some discussion of a different path for China and a weaker China or a failing China is just as probably troublesome to the region uh, as is a strong China. In addition to, to that, there is also this idea that um, uh, if you see China as a principal focus of uh, you know, U.S. strategy in the Asia-Pacific region, the Chinese themselves could opt for um, a competitive strategy that basically occurs largely outside of the military domain and therefore sort of undercuts any military, you know, any military buildup that's associated with countering them. We do think that the uncertain trajectory in North Korea will remain a dominant concern, particularly for U.S. ground forces for some time to come. North Korea has three paths. It can either, uh, you know, at some point unify with South Korea. It can col collapse uh, in on top of itself, or it can actually continue to uh, um, engage in provocative or aggressive behavior that somehow leads to war between the North and South. So we do think North Korea remains important. Perhaps PACOM's most dominant daily trend, frankly, is natural catastrophe and climate change. Um, it was a dominant theme when we went out to PACOM and talked to them. Uh, it's probably their, you know, their, their most frequent re requirement for contingency response. Uh, so we do think it's one to consider in the, the PACOM realm. And then finally, there's enduring ethnic and ideological disputes in the PACOM region, but we found them to be uh, probably not to a level that would require the large-scale employment of U.S. forces. So next slide. We came up with 10, uh, 20 vignettes. I can talk about any one of these in detail during Q&A, but here are the 20 vignettes. Uh, listed side by side. Uh, in U.S. CENTCOM, they really range in likelihood from a Syrian sanctuary problem that we're really seeing unfold uh, as we speak all the way to a future uh, Syria-Turkey conflict in a post-Assad environment. And you can see we have uh, eight other vignettes between those that we considered. In U.S. PACOM, again, sort of ranging from uh, the likeliest demands all the way up to sort of uh, <coughs> most speculative demands. We, we range from a pan-Pacific uh, tsunami, which largely requires sort of a homeland defense response on the part of the United States, all the way down to a Taiwan counter-lodgement. We're actually fighting physically in Taiwan. Next slide. 
some of the major implications for ground forces uh, that we came to um, that I want to just highlight. First, I really want to highlight this fact that future operating environment uh, will be disordered, asymmetric, distributed, and less decisive. We think the more there are a number of constraints that are emerging at the policy level coming out of um, coming out of uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there will be a natural aversion and uh, self-deterrence associated with future contingency operations. The objectives pursued will be more limited and therefore the operations themselves are likely to be less decisive. US CENCOM, uh, CENCOM and US PACOM are very different in their, their demands, accepting the, poss the, the lower probability possibility of a major conventional or operation in the region. We think US CENCOM is really defined by its distributed security and peace operations and U.S. PACOM really by the enable and support actions and humanitarian response. Again, riffing off this idea on warning, there may be limited warning for the, like what we saw as the likeliest war fighting demands, again, falling in this distributed security category. Um, and that's really largely uh, stemming from this idea that they're most likely to emerge from challenges of disorder. And then finally, let me just again uh, emphasize the point that risk in all six categories that we identified is either increasing or static. Sam, if you could go th forward two slides. Let me just make a couple points on our risk assessment and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Um, oh, the overarching challenge uh, in the risk assessment um, problem, we think, uh, is twofold. First, there is a general sort of prioritization away from consideration of large-scale ground operations now going on um, inside the Pentagon for a variety of reasons. There's war weariness, there's uh, resource challenges, et cetera, et cetera, and the place that uh, you can go to mine sometimes the most resources is in the most manpower intensive services, obviously. Um, and that is competing really um, with this idea that um, we have become accustomed to one contingency focus over the last 12 years and have actually dispensed with a number of capability and capabilities and competencies that are more relevant, we think, going forward and that we're going to have to capture those. On the issue of projecting forces also, I think that's a key area. Increasingly, the force is CONUS-based. There are fewer forward deployed forces, um, which will require the United States to really have an employ equals or a deploy equals employ mentality with all of its ground forces that will be increasingly challenges, challenging with the forces based in the United States and with the challenges we have in logistics and lift. We think across the board forces will be more vulnerable to, to myriad threats um, from a wider variety of actors and, and as a result of that, uh, protecting those forces will be uh, increasingly important and in giving forces across the spectrum of response more ability to both protect themselves and conduct offensive operations will be uh, more important. And then finally, one interesting uh, point we came to on terminating military operations is that we think that given this idea that operations will be less decisive, the forces themselves will have to become more attuned to the idea of actually disengaging from environments that aren't necessarily fixed, um, where the conflict, will, the, the conflict or crisis is still very much in train at the time that that we disengage, but we have pushed it to a level that's manageable to the, uh, uh, to the view of US policymakers, and therefore it's time for US forces to, to disengage. It's a very different mindset than that we've had um, in the future, or in the past. And as we go forward, we think it's one that's likely uh, to require um, more attention on the part of the forces. I'm going to turn it over uh, at, at this point. We have some more charts. I don't want to bore you anymore. Um, and we'll kind of punt everything to question and answer after that. But thank you very much. We're very grateful for your being here, and we look forward to the Q&A portion after my colleagues have an opportunity to talk. Mr. Pavel. Thanks, Nate, very much, and thanks for inviting me um, to this uh, session. I'll be very provocative and very brief in the interest of having a conversation and also because there's a lot of uh, rich knowledge to mine um, among the, my fellow panelists. Sort of first and foremost, I think this is a really excellent and rich uh, study, and I think it avoids the most common error that I see in strategy and force planning, and that is obviously emphasizing the contingencies that have dominated our thinking uh, over the last decade or so. Um, 
And so I think it has imagination and conceptual innovation. And I, cer I certainly applaud it. Um, it also happens to hit on some of the same issues that I've been very concerned about, um, including when I was uh, helping the White House um, sort of oversee the last QDR. And I'll get into that in, in a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to make four basic points. And then, um, again, I'll be very brief. And uh, hopefully, I'll stimulate some conversation. I think I will. Um, number one, we, we are just terrible at, pre at predicting future contingencies. I mean, there's no other way to say it. The only thing that's certain is that we will be surprised again by major future contingencies. Um, I'm doing a lot of work at the Atlantic Council with the National Intelligence Council and with other governments on global trends and disruptive technologies. And it's pretty clear to me after three trips to Silicon Valley over the last eight months that the world in five to ten years is going to be, is going to have some very different dimensions than it has today. And if we think the iPhone and the democratization of communications technology has changed things, wait till you see the rest of the technology revolutions come to play in terms of bi uh, biotech and the democratization of production that's represented in 3D printing and a range of other technologies that are coming on top of each other. And we don't know how it's going to play out, but we do know it will be disruptive. In some ways, that, that disruption will be very beneficial for the United States, but there's always a dark side to each of these uh, technologies that can be applied. So um, uh, the key trend I'm seeing is that of individual empowerment. And this is enabled by the large, uh, massive shift of resources to uh, Asia that's currently, or back to Asia, I should say, ma massive shift of economic strength that's currently ongoing that will uh, bring about uh, a very significant rise in the global middle class. But there's also this technology element that's, that's at play as well. Um, so let's start sort of with the baseline of the strategy that the, that the United States currently has in play. Um, I think we need a strategy and a portfolio of capabilities that hedges against this very uncertain environment in, in, appropriate, way, in appropriate ways. Um, it's really important to keep in mind, and I was part of the bureaucracy before, but the bureaucracy's <laughs> strong inclination is to resist change and to strive to focus on the comfortable. And in this case, the comfort zone um, is one where we love to deal with uh, militaries that look like us. And so in this case, I think the, the department's natural inclination to focus 80% of its efforts in strategy and planning on, on dealing with a Chinese contingency is understandable, makes some strategic sense, but I think it's overplayed to a degree. And as I said, I, I worry very much that the uncomfortable but extremely plausible scenarios, uh, some of which Nate covered in this study very well, I think are going to come, come back to bite us in um, unfortunately very damaging ways. And so my, the summary of my first point is that the current culture of, auto, of sort of uh, automaticity, of autonomy of the key departmental components in the, in the Defense Department and of the drift towards the symmetric is probably the single greatest strategic challenge that we face. I think it's much more significant than the resource constraints, but we can talk about that. Um, so we can't wish away scenarios that we would prefer not to engage in. It certainly would be nice if the world would let us uh, pivot toward Asia and focus our efforts there. But we do know that when we're surprised and when we're attacked, when our interests are dealt a very se severe blow, we will deploy ground forces in very messy scenarios again, I have absolutely no doubt. My second major point is we have a very underhedged portfolio. And it's related to the first point. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of scenarios that could place very significant demands on our military forces, in particular our ground forces. And the current DOD strategic tra trajectory implies a much greater degree of precision about the locus of future operations than is really warranted. Um, it strikes me that the best way to prepare for being surprised, which we should do, is to ensure that we in ingrain strategic foresight into our planning processes to a much greater degree than is currently the case. Um, I think the likelihood of strategic shocks that Nate mentioned is very high over the next five to 10 years. Just look back over the last five to 10 years at the near misses, at the things that actually did happen. And you'll have a sense that uh, the next five years certainly will include some of those. And so the department's process needs to change more to one that systematically scans the horizon in key areas 
and then appropriately hedges our strategies, capabilities, and military posture accordingly. Let me just mention two scenarios that I uh, spend a little bit of time uh, talking to people a lot smarter than I am <coughs> uh, about. So I'm, I would not say I'm expert in these. But these are two that I worry about. Number one um, is that the scenario of failed states with WMD. We're seeing that play out a little bit in uh, Syria. But I promise you I wrote these words before we heard about the, the red lines being blurred to a pink line. <laughs> um, and it strikes me that in, in, for this scenario set, I think there is some good work going on in the department. I don't want to be too, uh, too much of a blunt instrument. But the current approach uh, to this set of scenarios, in particular that of Pakistan, is to re it, that the department undertakes is to highly compartmentalize the activities that are underway. It's very sensitive, and so we have to be very careful, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think this actually has a way of limiting the needed strategies and investments and capabilities because it's so sort of off on us on one side. We need to open this up. We need to talk about this. This is the way a healthy democracy helps to ensure that there's a fully informed defense policy debate. And, and I worry, when I look around the world and see where's the greatest gap between supply of capabilities and demand on our forces, to me it's this scenario set. It's extremely uncomfortable. We don't have the strategies. We don't have the capabilities in some cases. We don't have the technologies in some cases. Where we do have capabilities, we don't have enough of them. So there's capacity questions. We don't have the alliance relationships. And we probably don't have the necessary resources. Besides that, we are all set for these uh, <laughs> scenarios. And I think they should be central for sizing and shaping uh, elements in this QDR that's about to uh, kick off. The second set is um, a little fuzzier, but I'm worried about bio. And I think bio-enabled attacks, uh, the chances of those are going to increase as the biotech revolution accelerates and as it proliferates centers of excellence across the world. Uh, the chances of a non-state actor using these technologies to greatly damage US interests is unfortunately rising uh, very dramatically. Um, and we can certainly talk about some of those things in the Q&A. And I don't think the department is close to being prepared for such contingencies. When the Atlantic Council had a conference on global trends uh, last December, and uh, there was a panel on the future of war with Michelle Flournoy and Tom Enders, this was the one question I asked Michelle. Um, you, can check it, you can check out the video of this panel. It's still on our website. I said, how prepared is the department for this set of scenarios? She said, nowhere near being prepared uh, for these, which was very concerning to me. Point three, a little bit more on these scenarios. Uh, you know, it's, these were interest number five on Nate's, um, on Nate's list of US interests. Uh, and I think, you know, I look at the defense strategic guidance from last January of 2012. Um, it listed counter WMD as one of the missions. But I would argue that it really isn't a priority, unfortunately, um, or at least as much as it should be. There's a gap between the mission list, I think, in this case, and the capabilities and force posture. Uh, that would be needed to carry it out with confidence. There's sort of a, over a dozen different units and organizations that sort of have pieces of this mission um, uh, in the department, but there's little synergy from what I can tell, and there's not very strong integration nor unity of command. Um, um, you know, if you can name one officer at even the three-star level that has this mission as his or her singular priority, I'm willing to listen. I'm not sure if I've found that person yet. If you counted the number of WMD professionals in the combatant command staffs, I think you'd have an interesting indicator of the degree to which this priority mission, which was listed in the president's guidance, is actually being resourced, even in terms of personnel allocation, but let alone in terms of other <coughs> aspects of how one underwrites a strategy. Um, so my own view is we should reverse this, uh, chain, uh, overcome the stovepipes, and do a little more balancing of our limited resources to get this to the level of national attention that it warrants before it's too late, really. My fourth point is uh, very basic and very short. Resources, um, I think we've all been to enough of these events that talk about the resource constraints that we're working through. Um, I think they have a way, a beneficial way of tending to focus the mind a little bit on what strategy really is, which is the art of connecting your resources to your uh, strategic ends using various um, various means. And so I think anyone who says, you know, we should develop the strategy and have the uh, capabilities in a resource unconstrained environment, I, I, here I quote Hoss Cartwright, uh, 
uh, strategy without a sense of resources is a hallucination. Um, and so um, strategy actually demands a sense of the resources that we think we will have available. That doesn't mean you can't marshal more resources, perhaps the president's job, the Congress's job, but we can't resource everything to the fullest extent. That's not strategy, that's just doing everything we want to do. Mm. So uh, I think uh, a, a heavy dose of resources is useful in this discussion, but I don't think that we're anywhere near the point where we can't resource the most important priority missions in a cost-effective way. That does assume that the Pentagon actually comes uh, to realize what the private sector has realized, this thing called 21st century business practices, <laughs> um, headquarters operations. I could give you a list of the redundancies in the headquarters of the, of the department right now that would probably squeeze out another 10% of the budget, but that's a, probably for another seminar. And I'll end there. Great, thanks. <laughs> General? Thanks, Nate. Thanks for the <clears throat> introduction. Thanks for inviting me, not just here, but to participate in the thinking process uh, through. I'm going to pick up where the study actually ended, uh, and that's with uh, denial, which of course is not just a river in Egypt, it's a climate very much alive here uh, within the Beltway. We just uh, would like not to have to have large numbers of ground forces. We'd like to believe they're not really necessary. We'd like to think that we can anticipate the kind of war that uh, the future will hold for us. And uh, shape the strategic environment uh, and our military force to that future. One wonders if we could actually do this, why haven't we done it? We'd also like to think that we can prevent uh, future threats to American interests because of our advanced intelligence forecasting uh, capacity. I'm going to leverage off that. <laughs> Again, one wonders if we could actually do it, why haven't we? And we believe that should we fail in the forecast, uh, some rapid, decisive operation or lethal, fast, remote use of force will resolve the issue, or we'll have enough time to raise the forces that are necessary to meet whatever the challenge uh, we're facing. And finally, we like to think that the destructive power of our military forces, which is pretty significant, will resolve whatever conflict of the day the nation faces. Uh, end of destruction equals end of fighting equals end of war equals end of problem. Though history and, of course, the last 12 years of war should teach us exactly the opposite. Now, this is the story, though, that we tell ourselves. The story isn't true. It's fiction. And it's not been true for a while. And we've covered the fiction in the past because we had sufficient size. We built a sufficiently large military force with balanced capabilities in naval power and air power and ground power special operations power, to cover the fact that we really don't know what the future will hold. And though we didn't want to admit it, size and balanced capacity offset uncertainty and inability to predict in the past. Matter of fact, the study that uh, Nate and his uh, colleagues authored quotes Secretary Gates at West Point, who says, and I quote, when it comes to predicting the nature and location of our next military engagement, at least since Vietnam, our record has been perfect. We've not gotten it right once. What remains unstated, though, is that these lesser included contingencies of the past, that is, all of our actual operations, <laughs> were possible because we sized against large conventional threats. Dealing with Noriega in Panama required large numbers of ground forces. So did reseeding the Aristide government in Haiti so did enforcing the Dayton Accords, so did liberating Kuwait. All this while the Berlin, was, Berlin Wall was falling, the Soviet Union was collapsing, and we paid ourselves a peace dividend by shrinking the very forces that were now more often being used. Fewer ground forces were certainly uh, necessary for the destructive phase, the regime changes in Iraq and Afghanistan. But we seem to have already forgotten, because we're tired, that the post-regime operations required the nation to transform the Army Reserve components to 200,000 more operational reserves and hire almost 200,000 contractors. The stress in our military is not the result of having too many. It's the result of having too few. And now we tell ourselves never again, which of course we have told ourselves before. 
But with the CSIS study and the National Intelligence Council study, Global Trends 2030, and CNAS's study, Driving in the Dark, and a bunch of others, uh, we have several data points that tell us that uncertainty is the norm in our strategic environment. The potential for conflict is increasing, and the types of conflict are most likely the kinds that can't be resolved with mere destructive power. The Global Trends study comes right out to say that the potential for multiple forms of war comes at a time of rising uncertainty as to the United States' willingness or ability to be the guarantor of security, and at a time of increased ambiguity as to the stability of international systems. In times of such uncertainty and ambiguity, with increased likelihood of conflict, we need to tell ourselves the truth, not to hold on to our fiction. A, strategic leaders need more options, not less, and the options associated with the kinds of complex contingencies that are in the CSIS study, or the kinds of hybrid warfare, irregular warfare, intrastate warfare, war amongst the people, whatever else you want to call these things, will require more ground force capacity, not less. And of course, we prefer at least a relatively clearly defined semi-conventional state-based threat upon the, that the U.S. military must deter and defeat, and upon which we can size our forces. Unfortunately, this is not the reality that we face. We, have to, we do have some potential uh, threats like this, and we have to have the military forces necessary to deal with them. But these now have become, unlike the past, the lesser included contingencies. The real issue is having a large enough and balanced enough force to deal with the areas of increasing risk outlined in this study, the areas of uh, likely archetypical mission sets in this study, and others similar to them. The problem is doing so doesn't fit our story because making these adjustments may require more ground forces, not less, changes, not stability. Unfortunately, reality has a way to forcing itself on a nation with global responsibilities and global interests. Certainly, the Johnson administration didn't want to get bogged down in Vietnam. The Bush 41 administration didn't want to invade Panama. The Clinton administration didn't want to do Bosnia. The Bush 43 administration didn't want to fight terrorists and nation building. And some future administration may well find itself having to do just what it does not want to do. Mm -hmm. And when they find themselves in this position and turn to the military for options, time and decision space will not be on their side. Forces in being provided the previous administrations with options. Forces in potentia count much less. So the CSIS study uh, we're talking about today, as well as others, is very clear. The varieties of confrontations and conflicts that seem part of our collective strategic future cannot be resolved by destruction alone, or solely by light, lethal, fast, and remote military action or by small special forces operations. The real threat, in my view anyway, the real threat that we face is ourselves and our ability to deny what we need and choose instead what we prefer. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Mr. Hoffman. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for letting me be part of this uh, study. Uh, I'm a career think tanker, and, and this is unfortunately an all too rare example of a useful think tank product uh, uh, that I think provides some intellectual scaffolding that OSD I think will ultimately appreciate, even if they might not recognize it immediately, uh, per, per Barry's remarks. Uh, you know, the, the art of strategy is all about thinking about possible futures to inform decisions you make, you know, today in the present, and that's a challenge that the department is facing. Uh, uncertainty, friction, and constrained resources are the unwanted but constant companions of defense strategists. Uh, and we've all faced this in, in our time in the building. Uh, and as defense spending gets quite constrained, which unfortunately it appears it's going to, to in the next few years, defense planners are really going to have to come to some fundamental assumptions, open up some biases, and think through uh, creatively the ways and means logic that we've used in the past. And there's a lot of pressure on the way on the means, so I think we're going to have to be more creative about the ways. Uh, formulating sound strategy 
is going to require thinking anew about scenarios, which I think is the most commendable aspect of this particular approach here. We're going to have to make some tough trade-offs, which this study tees up for conversation. And we're going to have to face some new threats and missions, uh, as Barry in this report suggests, more than we're currently doing right now. Uh, I was asked to talk about risk today. The part I like about the, this particular study the most is about risk. It's a component of strategic planning. Uh, we often talk about the logic of end ways and means, but the, the fourth component is exploring, understanding, and not denying risk, as the general pointed out. Uh, we do face limited information, and we have to admit uh, that, that uh, there are some limitations to both our decision-making ability and our processes. It's not about our intelligence, or it's not about our intelligence agency. It's just the nature of the environment. In fact, one criticism about a slide in there, there's a, there's a phrase, you know, for the foreseeable future. There is no such animal <laughs> as the foreseeable future. So a, a, a prudent strategist is, has to ask the right questions, and that's what this particular product is all about. It's about questions and, and exploring issues that we're not comfortable with. Uh, we're coming to grips with the deep underlying trends that are going to reshape the secure environment and the landscape in the years ahead. Uh, my boss, General Dempsey, has been doing this with his speech on the security paradox. Uh, this, this notion that peace is breaking out or that we can control the world and influence events with a smaller and cheaper force uh, with, the, with the range of changes going on in the out years creates a huge paradox. So there's many people very comfortable that we live in a very prosperous world in which the number of wars or the lethality of wars is going down. And that's not the trend that I'm seeing for the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, the evidence suggests that our future is not going to be linear continuation of the last few years or, or the next couple of months. It's not going to be as benign as the era that we've lived in since the fall of the Cold War. And we need to anticipate that, I think, with a little more intellectual rigor. Um, I liked, again, this risk aspect in the study, the balance beam metaphor between the current force and the future force. Uh, that's, that's the essence of, of thinking about the future. And you can get that balance wrong. If you can overinvest in your comfort zone and sustain the forces you have today, um, and you can create future risk by, by being unprepared for the future. And conversely, you can think about things you'd like to think about and ignore reality, and you can overinvest in the future or in the wrong future because you're blinkered uh, by, by denial, as the general pointed out. And you can create a, a force that is unprepared for the future, although you've tried to anticipate it with the greatest degree of rigor that you could. Uh, we should not look out too far, and we should not create our, our own risk by not being prepared for the things that we, we, we know to be uh, much more likely. Uh, you know, the kind of contest that's going on in Washington, D.C. that studies like this kind of expose it a little bit is there is always, you know, a war going on between the past and the present. Uh, folks that are holding on to their uh, comfort zones, the forces that they're most familiar with, the scenarios that they understand the most. Um, but the, the more you do that, I think the greater you're setting yourselves up for future risk with far greater impact than we recognize now, which I, I really liked Barry's comments about the future, the, the revolutionary changes in multiple sciences and the combinations of those sciences uh, suggest that we really need to think much more rigorously about the future. I think DOD recognizes this risk, maybe not to the degree in open forums that we, that we did, but um, I think in the last QDR and particularly in the strategic guidance, uh, we, I think we tried to come to grips with many of those things uh, to the degree that we could. Um, we had a very rigorous process. There's a, a pretty complex range of scenarios that was employed, combinations of different scenarios to test the force in both its shape and its size. Um, the guidance is a little more explicit than some people would like. There's aspects in there that are hedging and mitigating the reversibility language. Uh, I know the guidance has its, uh, its critics, and occasionally I get critical about some aspects of it. Uh, but things like uh, the shift and the pivot to the Pacific, uh, the things like air sea battle concepts whether you like it or not are attempts by the strategy community to move forward to look at the future and to deal with future challenges risks and in this upcoming QDR I hope hope language like this uh, is going to influence that a little bit so again we can continue to push forward into the future again minimizing future risk unfortunately there are a number of contextual uh, factors that are really going to influence, I think, risk even more than, than we've mentioned today. In addition to the disruptive revolutions that, that Barry identified, I've got five contextual uh, factors that I presented to this particular group. And, and one that we should concern us is, uh, is just the scale, scope, and viability of our industrial base. I, I believe that manufacturing and, and some areas of the, of the force, the industrial base is pretty fragile, if not thin. 
uh, Dave Berteau and some others here are experts in that particular area. But in my time in the building, the amount of effort we had to do to sustain naval aviation, naval shipbuilding, and uh, and missile production capacity is, is, is a, at a tenuous level in some areas. And I think it's going to get a little thinner uh, in the near future. We also face a rising manpower cost problem. Uh, the percentage of the, of the budget available to pay for the force is what is another factor that's driving the force size down. Uh, uh, if every soldier and Marine is 60% more expensive today than they were when the war started, uh, we're, we're going to end up cutting the size of the force just to, to to keep the pay and benefits up. It's crowding out investment and it's pushing down the force size. The same is true with modernization costs. You know, we're replacing $50,000 Jeeps with $250,000 vehicles. We're replacing $1 million vehicles with $15 million vehicles. We're replacing $20 million helicopters with $120 million helicopters. Uh, that too, at those kinds of replacement cost curves, you know, we're on the wrong side of the cost imposing strategy uh, and, and we need to get our hands around that, but it's very hard and again, that pushes down your force structure size and it, and it pulls up investment level, but for a much smaller force. Clark Murdoch's done a very nice study here about the erosion uh, of these inflation factors eating up the inside of the budget while at the same time we're pressing down, it's kind of a double whammy. Um, that's really gonna affect the capacity and the size of the force. And so our ability to deter and our ability to respond, the amount of time it takes to get to places and to assist people is, is gonna be longer, more risk, more cost over time. Uh, in addition to the double whammy of Clark's paper, I'd, I'd add the triple whammy. I, I think we're going to have f fewer friends and allies and partners in the future that are viable, successful, and interoperable with us. I see we have a few allies and friends in the room today. But uh, in general, through either demographics, through politics, through uh, errors of, of demographic decline and economic distress, in some areas in Europe, we're not going to have uh, the assistance and the friends and the allies we've had in the past, at least in quantity. Hopefully they'll, they'll be there with us, but that, that produces a triple whammy. And, and all this affects you know, the size of the force and affects the demands we're putting on a force trying to do many, many things. Uh, it's not going to be a specialized force. It's going to be a general purpose force, and it's going to have to adapt to different scenarios over time. And that in and of itself is a training risk and a force management risk that we're not dealing with. On top of these uh, contextual factors, I think increase future challenge risks is the, what I call the cognitive challenge that General Dubik dealt with. There's an idea that we can have wars that are short, clean, and easy, rather than brutish, hard, ambiguous, and long. And we need to get past that. Uh, the, last, the last decade is noted. Uh, it's ugly. It's expensive. It hasn't been very successful. Uh, but as this scenario development exercise indicates, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be more frequent uh, in our future. We can ignore it. Uh, we can be unprepared. We can react unprepared and put the burden on the soldiers and Marines that are going to respond. Uh, but that's not a, a proper strategic approach. So let me wrap up a little bit here. Risk can be self-inflicted. It can be self-inflicted by denial. It can be self-inflicted uh, by our own strategic unwillingness to challenge our biases and unexamined assumptions. It can be self-inflicted by bureaucratic inferences, seams, and mission orphans. And we have some of those. We cannot eliminate risk and avoid all surprises. There's no such thing as a risk-free security environment. Scenarios and studies like this, I think, are really critical and all too rare, unfortunately, to, to avoid self-inflicted surprise and enhance strategic uh, decision-making in the building. And for that, I find it to be a very uh, commendable activity. Um, in, in closing, you know, the kind of scenarios here, I, th I think in the building, we're going to have to come to grips with the frequency and the consequence of these, the timelines, uh, the importance of some of the scenarios. There's, a, there's another level of analysis that needs to go on with this particular work that uh, hopefully somebody in the building will want to see done. Uh, maybe they'll give it to me to do, but <laughs> maybe they'll give it to you to do. Uh, but we need to think through these things. Some of these scenarios, uh, I agree with Barry, are, are outside and should be uh, thought of as part of the QDR force sizing and force shaping uh, thought process and would probably have to be resourced. Uh, some of them may be inside the, uh, the major scenario and have to be thought of as a limited uh, you know, lesser included offense for which we're not as prepared, for which we're not willing to train to, which we're not willing to have the unique doctrine or the opportunities and the correct equipment in, in, in every single case. Um, we just have to, have to come to that. That's, that ultimately is, is the risk money match balance beam that the building's going to have to do. We probably can't do that here from the outside. So let me wrap up. Uh, I always like to quote my good friend and colleague over in the UK, Colin Gray. Uh, Colin says, force planners, 
folks like myself and Barry have only two cardinal virtues, two cardinal principles we must follow, prudence and adaptability. Uh, prudence is all about risk and being honest about risk, understanding risk, not just closing your eyes to it and saying that you've accepted it, uh, but truly understand the risk that, that, that's in it. Uh, studies like this are very prudent. And adaptability, uh, building the forces we probably need, not the ones we want to have, but the ones we really need, and making them adaptive enough to react to multiple uh, scenarios is probably uh, the kind of premium we're going to have on our, our force size. And you have suggested here in this study uh, the range of adaptability, the range of scenarios, and the missions and the capabilities that the force is really going to need. Now the big question is you know, capacity. Right. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists, actually. They did a great job. So what I'm going to do now is we'll open it up to questions. We have microphones back there. Harlan, I see you have your hand up right away. We'll go ahead and get you first. Steve Gore. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. Thanks for your comments. I'd like to expand the aperture of the study three ways. First, as Frank Hoffman mentioned, CSS did a very good study with which I agree that by the end of the decade, if you assume constant defense spending, you'll be faced with either having no procurement or cutting the force in half. So how do you take into account those resource realities? Second, it seems to me our failure has not been military over the last 12 years, but it's the civilian side of the effort. And I find it difficult to see engaging in a lot of areas by the military without any kind of civilian backup. So how do you deal with that? And third, this report obviously has been isolated to look at ground forces, but can you say what you need in terms of the supporting maritime and naval forces, which obviously are going to go along with this package. Great. OK, so I'll take a crack at all three of those from the perspective of the report, and then I'll open it up. Um, clearly, the resource realities, I mean, my, my view on the resource realities uh, is this. Um, first, you have to get the capability right. Like, what is it that the, you're going to ask your force to do? And then, and then, you, and then you need to worry about the ca capacity. Now, unfortunately, those are both under those questions. We're trying to answer both of them at the same time under an extreme amount of pressure. We've suggested um, the capability is probably different than what you wanted pre 9/11. You know, pre 9/11, we were really focused on the North Korea Iraq problem. Post 9/11, we became focused on the extinguishing terrorism problem and counterinsurgency. We think. We're probably entering for the ground forces a different epoch that requires different capabilities. The question, I think, that or I mean, the point that Frank brought up on what's then the capacity? That's the next step. You got to test it. Um, I, I'm a bit, you know, concerned that we're not going to get to that next step. We're just going to actually make the reductions first and then figure out if we can do something with it later. Um, but, but I think that's what I, getting the capability right is is important. Now on your point on the civilian, I just actually was at the Army War College and I talked about a very similar topic on the civilian military balance with respect to complex contingencies. I mean, I think that if you think the defense budget's going down, don't expect the civilian capacity to suddenly expand. I mean, it's going to go down as well. Um, unfortunately, the military has always, as, as, as of late anyway, filled the capacity gap in that regard and will likely be asked to continue to do so, which is another reason why you need to maintain an adaptable force that has the ability actually to do multiple missions and multiple roles and take on things that aren't necessarily purely military responsibilities all the time. I just am not confident that there's going to be a sudden revolution in civilian, uh, civilian contingency capacity. And then finally, joint forces. I mean, I would say the one thing that really comes out clearly in this, and this will be, again, a question of assessing the balance between what you believe is the most important threat is with a CONUS-based force right now, largely CONUS-based, and that includes both the Army and the Marine Corps, frankly, they have to get there. Um, and the places that we're currently assuming the most risk is in the area of strategic mobility. Um, and and the, the, the likelihood that that's going to continue to be an area of risk based on current policy priorities is increasing. I mean, and we found that to be the longest pull in the tent with respect to projecting the forces. You have fewer forces forward, you have more forces back in CONUS, and you're taking more risk in deployability and, and power projection. Somehow, you either have to determine that you don't want to project the force in the numbers that might be suggested, or that you have to take some uh, remediation to change that uh, imbalance right now. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a little, little crack, uh, Harlan. I think in terms of uh, resources, 
the easy way out uh, is to cut the number of Marines and soldiers, the personnel costs. They are going up. We have to, we have to figure out a ways to uh, reduce the, the personnel cost, no doubt about it. But the, the uh, issues of modernization costs that Frank talked about, the bureaucratic overhead costs that Barry talked about, the shrinking of the industrial base that drives co costs up, these are all really hard and, in my opinion, will be less likely to address and uh, therefore get to the scenario that you described where we just keep cutting the personnel uh, size because it's the easiest, the one with the least lobby. Uh, but then that drives us to a position where uh, you don't have an adaptable force because you don't have a force. Right. If you don't have a force, you can't adapt to anything. Right. And one thing that, as a, as a trainer and a commander, uh, many of the skills and disciplines and competencies that I used in the invasion of uh, Haiti in 1994, in the peace accord, in uh, enforcing the peace accords in Bosnia, uh, and in training the Iraqi security forces, are derivative mm -hmm. from the, the uh, skills that you get from a general purpose force. Mm -hmm. They have to be modified, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But that the adaptability comes from the core skills and from the uh, and from the core equipment. So I I I see the the ease of personnel costs being driving us to a position where we are incurring the most strategic risk. Barry, okay. Uh, next question. Yes, ma'am. Right here in the middle. We could. We have a mic coming right up behind you. Hi, Sand. Am I on? Yep, you're on. Okay, good. Hi, Sandy Sorsbach from China Lake. I'd like to go back to the comment that Frank made about cognitive challenges um, of getting over the clean and easy wars and trying to explain that we're going to have nasty wars. Um, General Mattis addressed that, too, in one of the uh, speeches he gave at, the, at, the, um, at, at Kennedy School. How, when he says, you're going to go to America and say, give us your sons and daughters and a lot of money, I'm kind of summarizing in a lot of money, right. and trust us. How do we go to the American people and how do we go to Congress and form that narrative? Because we're wrestling with that in the Navy too. And how do we form some kind of a narrative that says, hey, we know what we're doing and we explain it pretty well because we don't seem to. We don't seem to be able to get the message across that things aren't really going spiffily and you don't, you know, you don't need to send everybody home because everything's fine. We don't seem to know how to get that message across to middle America or to the folks that are coming into Congress who are increasing, increasingly isolated from the military. Any, and, and I'll open it up to anyone in the panel. Any ideas on how to do keep, that? Keep Jim Mattis around a little bit longer. I know, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me take a quick crack. I mean, one of the things I think that we came to in the process of this study is we, we think that, in general, there's going to be a greater degree of, and you're seeing it right now play out, frankly, with respect to Syria. Um, uh, there's going to be a greater degree of self-deterrence, right? Um, and that's going to, there's, there's a couple of impacts that that's going to have on operations. The first impact it's going to have is you're likely to go late. You're going to wait so long that you're likely going to enter under very, you know, imperfect circumstances. And therefore, the art of the possible is actually limited from the beginning. Um, but by the same token, I think the missions themselves will likely be chartered, or there's, the, the, there'll be a tendency that the missions themselves will be chartered under a more limited mandate than we've seen in the past, an open-ended. And I think a limited mandate, all, and I, accepting all of the professionals on the stage here who will you know, uh, tell me that the fog of war and mission creep and all those things actually always extend a limited mandate. But the bottom line is, is a limited mandate is more easily explainable, right? It is, instead of revolutionary transformation of a society or raising a democracy in, uh, in a foreign country or something like that, a much more limited mandate, which we suggest in our report falls many times under the distributed security mission where you're literally st standing with your backs to something important and your rifles pointed out that's at risk and important to you, um, that limited mandate is, is more explainable to the American people. And then I'll open it up. Yeah, particularly, I mean, some of these scenarios are more humanitarian. Um, you know, they're, they're easy to sell. I think we need to explain to the American people the treaty, the <coughs> treaty requirements we've established. We have friends, partners, and allies we have commitments to, and I don't hear too many people, particularly even among my civilian political class, you know, recognizing that. Uh, we, have, we have agreements and obligations to people, and we need to be prepared to live up to those agreements and obligations as well. 
uh, and I hope some of our other friends in both in Asia and in Europe can sustain their obligations and their partnerships as well. Uh, but I think we can explain that to the American people. G General Mattis does a really good job. <laughs> there's, 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 there's both on the civilian side and I think on the uh, military side, there's, there's people who recognize this. This is what we wrestle with in the building all the time. Uh, and it's hard. Uh, it's, there's, you know, there's, there's priorities that do have to be set. It's not an easy job. It's, it's not that people are, um, you know, pulling something over on the American people or pulling, you know, wool over their own eyes. It's, it's, it is a hard task and we have to adapt from the past. Uh, this contest between the, the future and the past, we have to unleash ourselves a little bit. Uh, there are, are new challenges and it's hard to get rid of the old challenges and start making the investments in cyber, bio, and the things that fully agree with uh, Barry uh, that a decade ago, several of us thought was, was gonna come with much more fury and much more uh, violence and uh, lethality than, than we've seen, thank God, uh, up to this point. But these, these revolutions intersect informatics, material sciences, nano, and, and cyber, and bio, and they just, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna impact us. And I think we can continue to educate the American people. Uh, but, you know, BRACs, reinvestments, alterations, uh, getting rid of the, uh, the, the, going towards more lean operations, less headquarters, taking out positions of government that I've been in at, you know, the, the middle management level, level uh, you know, maybe, maybe we need to get to those points so we can invest in, in the capabilities at the pointy end where people really have more, more risk than getting a paper cut like I had in my time in the Pentagon. Anybody else? No. Next question. Yes, sir. Right here in the front. Our good friend. George Nicholson, a policy consultant for special operations. You alluded to it, but I know Congressman Adam Smith, ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, said, you know what a huge supporter I am of the defense budget. But I go back to my district, and I've got Fort Lewis in my district. I've got McCord Air Force Base. My constituents don't want to hear about problems of drawing down the military. What they want to talk about is Social Security. What they want to do is talk about Medicare, Medicaid, uh, losing their 401ks. And you know, we just don't seem to be getting that message across. And the other piece of that is we saw on Tuesday the release of the French White Paper on their defense budget. They're cutting their defense budget. Our huge supporters, like the British, have had to cut back on their military. Uh, what, how do the American people look at it and say, we want to spend all this money on our military our key allies out there, these other economies, are cutting back. Why should we be doing being the worldwide policeman? Um, well, the, I think the first thing I would suggest is we didn't take a position that we should be the worldwide policeman. Um, in fact, I, I think one of, the, one, of, one of the things we really endeavored to do in this report is actually t talk about the, 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 the real need for some appetite suppressant with respect to contingency operations. I mean, that, that you, you really endeavor at the beginning, again, back to my point over here, endeavor at the beginning to really set minim, you know, minimum acceptable and achievable objectives, set out to achieve them, and when you do, you know, then you reevaluate whether to disengage or not, but, but setting expansive objectives. And then the other thing is the, the whole reason that the study was chartered on this idea of core interest was really to get down to you know, brass tacks and say, let's talk first about what's really important to use our ground forces for. It may be, for example, then you're talking about a once in 20 years sort of employment of your force. I'm not suggesting that, I'm just saying, but then at least you've actually defined what the left and right limits of that are. And, and frankly, then the sizing argument comes, is this, is, that's why it is the second step. Determine first what it is you want your force to do and, and, and really focus and target it in an era where we all know that the resources are declining and therefore you're going to have to be more uh, penny wise with respect to what you're investing in and then and then you get to the capacity argument later yeah we, we have a study coming out of NDU here pretty soon on discriminate force uh, that I'm a study member of and uh, you do need to impress the American people that you're being more discriminate mm -hmm. and more deliberate and more discerning about the situations that we get into and, and how we get in and, and accomplish what needs to be done. Uh, you've just pointed out basically the six contextual factor we should incorporate in this, and I've been worked with Adam Smith uh, the last couple of years. Uh, you know, this this is a problem. You know, if if we're over investing in things overseas that people don't see any value in, 
um, you're going to lose the support of the American people, uh, and we need to maintain that support. And unemployment up in Fort Lewis at 12 to 14 percent, while we're worried about keeping a brigade, say, in Germany and, and keeping some, you know, some village, you know, uh, more important than, than Fort Lewis, you're going to lose the support of the American people over time. That's something to factor into your strategy. <coughs> Uh, I, I'd just like to add, I'm not, not, not to refute anything you're saying, because when I go back, uh, back home that's, and talk to my family, it's the same, it's the same issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, gaining access is not just fighting your way in. That's, that's one way to gain access. Uh, but gaining access is establishing relationships, having rights, having bases, having allies. And uh, relationships require an investment in time. No relationship mm -hmm. is built uh, on a virtual basis. Uh, you can use virtual means to maintain a relationship, but it's people that are related, and you have to be there with people. So uh, we're, in a, we're in a position where, uh, for good reasons, we're, we're, we're uh, drawing into the United States uh, and becoming a CONUS base, have been for a good number of years, a CONUS base force. Uh, but the... Uh, uh, a Fortress America approach is not in our, is not in our best interest either. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the balance and the trade-offs are, are going to be real. And that's got to be part of the, of the thinking in, into uh, the basing strategy and ac access strategy, not just uh, bombing our way in. Mm -hmm. Barry? It's just a, r a really important point that I don't think gets a, a discussed enough. And there's a continuum of going too far and bringing everybody back making all the congressmen happy uh, and not having the benefits of what General uh, Duvick talked about. But I think currently we're too far to the other end of the spectrum in terms of our engagement activities. I don't see any sense of discipline or focus in our sort of far-flung, you know, COCOM-driven engagement and security cooperation strategies. When, when, when the, the Defense Department can demonstrate to the American people that they have indeed focused it and, and, and made it sort of live within the resources that we have, then I think we'll have a stronger story to tell and a stronger message. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure if you picked a random COCOM and said, how many countries are you engaging in in 2013? You know, sequestration aside, which may have changed things mm -hmm. in the last couple of months, um, I imagine you won't get a very sort of uh, a, a, a very tight answer mm -hmm. to that question. Times have not changed enough in the way the Department of Defense does its business, and it needs to change. Yeah, this idea of strategic targeting is like extreme. I mean, it's really important. We, th we, we ran into this in the report as well. It's just focusing your shaping activities. You know, first start with your interests and work your way back on the things that are most important. And then if you find at the end of the day, you're, you know, you have more in your checkbook than you thought, then you start adding on to it, but I think th that this is this idea of actually demonstrating the American people responsibility and the use of resources is a first step in that regard. We have time for one more question. It's this gentleman back here, and uh, we'll yes, wrap uh, up. Thank you. My name is Bill. Is this working? Should be. Okay. My name is Bill Courtney. I'm with CSC. Uh, <clears throat> General Dubik, you talked about reducing end strength being the easy option if other things aren't done. If the Army were a company, and of course, Secretary uh, Hagel addressed this the other day about some analogies being appropriate, some not. But if it were a company, uh, first thing we would do would be consolidate facilities. So we would address things like BRAC and depot, let's say, in the Army. Um, second thing we would do would be compensation reform. If we're overpaying some employees and underpaying others, let's say, if we, we've had a transition in technology or market conditions or whatever. Uh, there have been a lot of proposals for military compensation reform from the Defense Business Board and, and others. Um, the third thing we do is uh, we partner with other companies to get capabilities that we don't have quite so efficiently or effectively ourselves. And so you correctly point out about the importance of relationships with partners and things like that. So if you look at the two options of, if you will, on the one side, uh, improving the tooth to tail ratio, kind of the way a company would do, but of course, the Army has much greater political obstacles, for example, depots and things like that, versus end strength. Is there much potential to improve the tooth to tail ratio so that end strength doesn't have to be brought down so much? Uh, or is end strength going to bear 
all the hits because politics make it too hard to reform military compensation or consolidate facilities or, or modernize uh, IT and business processes and, and things like that. Okay, thanks. Do I go first there? Well, I mean, uh, first off, if you uh, understand tooth to tail ratio as reduction of overhead uh, infrastructure, um, we should get at that. Uh, in, in terms of compensation reform, we have to get at that. In terms of modernization, acquisition costs, you know, all those things we have to get at. But there's uh, another dimension of tooth to tail ratio that we have to be careful about, and that was in the theater setting circle that the CSIS uh, study did a pretty good job in describing. Uh, you can have a low tooth to tail ratio in uh, some, some services because the Army has the tail. Mm -hmm. And it's the tail for everybody. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we analyze uh, this, this kind of stuff, we just have to be accurate about the way we do it. Uh, and I think go after the political support necessary for those kinds of mechanisms that we know are real hard. I mean, how many times, if, if, if all of us would add up the number of times we heard the term acquisition reform, uh, you know, we would run out of paper writing it. Uh, we, we, you know, we've got to, we, you know, we've got to get the political support necessary to take on some of these really necessary and would be very helpful tooth-to-tail ratio mm -hmm. without destroying the tooth-to-tail ratio that we do need. Uh, another, another example of, uh, my opinion, of misanalysis is echelonment. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just cut out echelons in between? Well, cause we're, because a military force is not Walmart. The, the the, the environment in which you fight wars is much more uncertain than the environment uh, in which you restock your shelves. Uh, and further, the, the psychological benefit that junior commanders get from senior commanders and the information benefit that senior commanders get from junior commanders <laughs> is very much embedded in the echelon of our force. So again, I'm all for tooth to tail ratio reduction in those areas that are, that are uh, that are smart to do so, but I also think we keep our eyes open for uh, some of these things that are false savings. Right. I second that, Frank. A, a real quick, uh, a shameless self-advertisement, but another thing we would do in the corporate world is we would rate all the training and education accounts, and we would under undervalue human capital, education, yeah, R&D, exactly. and things. And I do work at National Defense University, and, and I, I would strongly suggest, although Educational technology and educational reform and educational initiatives are, are also part and parcel of overhead reduction and thinking about the future differently. But uh, we should maintain our human capital uh, to the degree we can on the qualitative and educational side. Well, with that, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, I would like to actually thank the panelists with a round of applause. Actually, I think they did a wonderful <laughs> job helping us talk about this. The report itself is available online as well as the critical question that we handed out at the beginning. Um, a video of this event will also be available online. We're extremely grateful uh, for your attendance today. And on behalf of CSIS and our President and CEO, John Hamry, I am very grateful for your attendance today and look forward to engaging with you on this important issue going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs>